your family and be prepared with survival foods and emergency preparedness kits. And now you can drink safe water with your own ProPure water filtration system, which removes fluoride and other harmful chemicals from your family's water supply. Save 10% with the promo code WATER. So join the revolution. Infowarsstore.com. Well, joining us today is Jerry Peterman. Now, he's a real renaissance man. He's a scientist, an inventor, an entrepreneur, a writer. We're going to talk to him about some of his fiction works here, but we're going to talk to him mainly about his engineering work. Now, that's varied as well. He's got patents on wireless communication, artificial intelligence. He's done active work on DNA research, but what we're most interested there with is his work on radiation, particularly Fukushima, and trying to assess really what our risks are here in this Fukushima event. And he has a site called FukushimaUpdateReport.com where he aggregates information about Fukushima. He's been doing that now, Jerry, for three years. because Almost, we're up to about the three-year anniversary of Fukushima, and it just keeps going and going and going. It's kind of the energizer bunny of nuclear disasters, isn't it? Yes, it is. It's, it's really shiny. Now, we have a lot of viewers who like to take charge of their own health. They do a lot of research. They work to make sure that they've got food supply, that they can prepare for disaster. How do they determine what their exposure is to nuclear reaction and, and to nuclear radiation? We've talked about the different types. Talk a little bit about the different types of radiation. I don't know that they can determine it because the government has certainly raised the levels of acceptable radiation as soon as this happened, mm -hmm. which I found very, very strange. Mm -hmm. I think the best thing to do is just not live on the West Coast. That would be the best thing to do, That's especially right. uh, Washington, Oregon area, because that area gets the uh, the uh, the blow by from the uh, from the winds across the Pacific uh, a lot sooner than uh, anywhere else. Uh, as far as the kinds of radiation there are, you have multiple kinds of of uh, either particulates or wave radiation. Well, before we get to that, let's talk about because a lot of people are confused just about electromagnetic radiation, because we do talk a lot about the negative effects of cell phones, of smart meters, of living under power lines. That radiation, electromagnetic radiation, is much different than ionizing radiation, like talking about alpha, beta, gamma rays, that sort of thing. So talk a little bit about that. Well, basically, if you have radiation from cell phones or power lines and that kind of thing, that doesn't strip off uh, electrons from your, or in, in uh, atoms, it doesn't, uh, it's not ionizing radiation. It will, it's capable of boiling water in, as in microwave radiation, but that's, that's really it. When you have nuclear radiation, then you have the ability to destroy DNA, to strip off electrons of atoms. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a, a whole different ball game. And of course, you can just switch off the electrical device that's producing the electromagnetic radiation, but you can't switch off nuclear radiation. That's what makes it so dangerous that it goes on for thousands, millions of years. That's correct, even billions of years. Mm -hmm. In Fukushima, the depleted, well, any nuclear power plant that produces depleted uranium, the half-life, or in other words, how strong it is, um, if the half-life is, say, four and a half billion years, as in depleted uranium, that means four and a half billion years, it's half as strong as it is today. So that's, that's just that's pretty powerful. So when somebody is, we have a nuclear incident because what happened in Fukushima could very easily happen here. We just had the former head of the NRC this last summer came out and said, it's been reported widely, the New York Times carried it. He said, we need to shut down every nuclear reactor in the United States because they share the same fundamental design flaw as the Fukushima reactor. And so we could have a Fukushima anywhere in the United States. We could have multiple of these events anywhere in the United States. So if that were to happen, how does someone evaluate their exposure to that? You, you know, there's, it's not just a West Coast isolation now, it's within the United States. How do they, as an individual, as, how do they prepare for that, to measure that? I'm not sure you can. Uh, an, an average person can't discern what a survey meter or Geiger counter, what the readings mean, because you don't know actually a, 
uh, a nuclear person may not even be able to tell with a survey meter because you can't tell what kind of uh, radiation you're dealing with. Are you dealing with particle radiation? Are you dealing with alpha, which is a particle, beta, which is a particle, or a gamma, or x-ray, uh, proton, neutron radiation? You don't know what you're dealing with. Uh, you really have to know what isotopes have been released from that particular accident. Uh, so there's a qualitative as well as a quantitative oh, issue with the radiation. Absolutely. And you're saying that the Geiger counter just gets the quantitative aspect of it, it, but there's still an issue of the qualitative. So talk about the different types of radiation, like the differences between alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Alpha is very interesting because it's a, it's a particle. It can be stopped by a sheet of paper or by basically by your skin. But if you get it into your body, you can end up with, say, the lungs, you can end up with lung cancer very easily. Beta is more powerful, and it has the ability, of course, all of it has the ability to strip electrons and that kind of thing, so it's ionizing. And uh, beta, is, beta is a lot more serious than, uh, than alpha would be. And uh, then you get into the various kinds of wave radiation, and that would be the... Um, the X-ray or the gamma, that kind of thing, and uh, of course there there is also you've heard of the neutron bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the uh, type of radiation that's a neutron emitter, and that's that's about as deadly as it gets. Now the Fukushima event's been going on for about three years, uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks. The concern is now they've they've tried to downplay the concern by saying that it's diluted by the fact that it's going into the water. However, the reality is, is that it's also being bioaccumulated throughout yes. the food chain. And that's very different. That's something you don't see with ordinary pollutants typically like you do with radiation because it's so persistent. It never gets metabolized. It just keeps accumulating and getting passed down the food chain. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, basically, in, in a bioaccumulation situation, you have tiny organisms that are eaten by larger organisms. And that goes all the way up to say in the, in the ocean to large fish like tuna because they eat smaller fish and smaller fish ate something smaller until it gets down to uh, plankton. And the plankton may have just a tiny bit of radiation there, but by the time you have accumulated all of this material, uh, you begin to have some fairly active, active material. I'll give you uh, uh, an example of bioaccumulation. We're now seeing a lot of trees and uh, various other pollutants in uh, south, southeast Texas from the uh, lignite coal fire plants. And I was opposed to that in the 80s of even building that because you had, um, or yeah, it, was, it was the 80s, uh, because you have lignite that has a tiny amount of radio, uh, r background radiation in it, but it accumulates at the rate of, of 10,000 time reduction in volume. So what becomes a, was a small amount in a huge uh, amount of material, when that material is reduced to an ash, then it becomes a, an accumulated amount. Yeah. And that being released into the atmosphere then is far worse than it just occurs in nature. And that's the problem with all the radiation that we have regarding nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. Because we've taken something in nature that is really not very strong and we have well, run it through centrifuges until we've got it down to highly concentrated, highly concentrated, highly refined, exactly. And then when you start putting it together, it produces other forms of of, uh, of matter that don't exist in nature. For example, plutonium. Mm -hmm. Plutonium does not exist uh, in in the uh, in the earth. We we have created that through the process, mm -hmm. and a few other various kinds of isotopes that are that are created by that process. Now, one of the things that you said that was very interesting in that, you're talking about a natural radiation that occurs in the lignite coal. We were told in California, don't worry about this radiation that you're picking up because it's just natural radiation. It might be thorium, it might be radium. And of course, in uh, McClellan Air Force Base, they took a lot of radium that was used for instrumentation in the, at the Air Force, and they just buried it on the base in massive quantities, massive concentrated amounts. People were concerned about that entering the water supply. They wanted them to take it somewhere away from a population center at the very least, but instead it was going to be inconvenient and expensive for the Air Force. So against the wishes of local government, the state government, they just buried it on site. That doesn't surprise me at all. You remember we were talking uh, a few years ago 
about burying everything, and it was NIMBY, not my backyard? Yes. Okay. We were going to bury everything <clears throat> that was accumulated from waste in the United States from nuclear power at Yucca Flats. Yes. We were going to go out, and we were going to encapsulate in glass and stick it in there. We have very little left now to, to bury. And nobody talked about burying. Well, why don't they talk about burying? Because the government went back to their buddies and they bought all the rods, and the rods were then turned into munitions, and the munitions were then dumped on in, in the uh, Mideast War. <laughs> uh, so we yes. now have 40,000 tons of material which has been dumped on Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm. Now, uh, so instead of burying it somewhere, we just turn it into weapons and shoot it at our enemies. Yes, and mm -hmm. a, gift, a gift that keeps on giving because now those people have to deal with something where they are uh, going to have to deal with it for four and a half billion years. Gosh, it, it is just, we had talked about this briefly just before the interview, how horrific these pictures of children and infants, the birth defects from depleted uranium and how concentrated they are in the Fallujah area. And then of course, it's not limited to just the people of Fallujah. It no. also affects the US Army veterans who were shooting it in their, in their tanks. And for the longest period of time, that was not allowed in the American military. But then again, they, they, they took off that ban and they said, go for it, guys. They well, really just, didn't care about the health of their soldiers. David, you have to remember who took it off. We're dealing with people that think Bohemian Grove and the Big Isle is a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're dealing with people who celebrate a, uh, a ceremony called the death of care. Uh, that is a misnomer. It should be the death of conscience because it takes a person with no conscience to be able to kill forever. Mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned to you before the interview, we were talking about people who uh, maybe become angry and they have a fight, and a few months or a year later, they're their best friends. It, it is the same with nations. We would uh, fight a war and, and uh, 10, 15, 20 years, that's, that's a trading partner, that's, that's a friend again. We don't have that opportunity now with the Middle East because that's a hot zone and nobody ever will go back to. And those people are dead forever. Mm. Uh, that makes no sense. And that's in the environment now, released into the environment. The only good thing about that having been released in the environment it, it, is that it is a heavy element that doesn't readily blow in the wind. Mm -hmm. It does to some degree, but it, it uh, doesn't spread as fast as some of the nuclear material that we have from Fukushima, that lighter elements that came across. Now, one of my concerns about nuclear power has always been the waste disposal. And as you mentioned, a massive amount of the waste disposal was turned, was weaponized and used in the Middle East. But we still have massive accumulations of it at nuclear reactor sites. And one of the things I think was unique about Fukushima was it brought to the public the, uh, they realized finally that it wasn't just a nuclear reactor problem exploding that we've seen in Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, but we also had to be concerned about the safety and the perpetual care and maintenance of these nuclear storage sites that are at the site of the nuclear facilities. And that's one of the reasons that this uh, former head of the NRC is saying that we need to fundamentally change these designs because they're so reliant on the continuing source of power to keep not only the reactors cool, but to keep these waste pools pool, uh, cool. Absolutely. Now, uh, I uh, said to Alex a, a few days ago in an interview, it, it's lunacy to do what we've done in the first place because if we ever lose cooling for the nuclear power plants, these plants will go critical. Well, what would it take to lose cooling? It simply takes a large belch from the sun to produce something called a Carrington event, mm -hmm. which is enough to shut down through electromagnetics, shut down uh, the power grid or fry small electronic components. Uh, for, for example, you couldn't get a truck started to run a diesel engine to pump water into there if, if all the systems had fried within the, the plant. Now, we've got a minimum of 711 nuclear power plants in the world, mm. and a Carrington event could easily wipe out all the uh, electronic systems that would control every single one of them, which means we have no way to cool any of them, and here we are with a planet-wide extinction event.
It's an insane thing. But I, I, I want to come back to what Einstein said. People, 